I want to invite you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke. And we are going to find ourselves this morning in Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2 this morning. And of course, we want to turn our attention uh, to somewhat of the birth narrative of Christ this morning. We are just a, a couple of weeks away from actual Christmas Day, uh, a day that has been set aside traditionally uh, by the church to recognize the coming of Christ. And I would mention, just while you're turning there, by the way, if, you, if you're having a hard time turning turning to Luke, uh, then I, I would just, I'd, I'd flip to my um, my index in my Bible real fast, or I would just pretend like I already found it, okay? I'm just trying to, no, I'm just picking with you, okay? Uh, but um, just, you know, just just for our information, uh, the the birth of Jesus Christ is something that was actually never celebrated in the uh, in the early church. It's never celebrated from a biblical standpoint, other than the worshiping shepherds and the angels who were in attendance on the first Christmas morning, the uh, the actual birth of Christ. Uh, but but other than that, uh, the scriptures call for us to celebrate his death and his burial, and even his resurrection. And that's what both of the ordinances of the church commemorate, is, uh, you know, baptism and the Lord's Supper are showing that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And so as we celebrate, I don't think it's wrong. No, don't, don't, please don't go away. Oh, preacher said we shouldn't celebrate it. Uh, no, I, I don't think it's wrong at all that we celebrate it, as long as we celebrate it in, in keeping with the, the reason why he came in the first place, and he was born to die on an old rugged cross. And so praise the Lord for that. Uh, Luke chapter number 2, and I, I want to read here from a, a larger portion of Scripture, and uh, I'll highlight, we're really just going to, uh, eventually we're going to wind up just in, in one main verse from the larger text that we're going to read from this morning. Luke chapter number 2, and let's begin our reading inside of verse number 25. And so the Bible says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or in other words, the Messiah. Verse 27, And he, that is Simeon, came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy, thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. In other words, God, you have fulfilled your promise. For mine eyes, verse number 30, have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray together this morning. Father, again, thank you for allowing us the privilege of being here inside of this service. And it's our prayer this morning that you would settle our hearts and our minds, that we would be focused upon your word. God, would your Holy Spirit have his way in our lives here this morning, would you, would you be pleased to take the Word of God and teach us by your Spirit so that we, we may learn? God, would you equip us today that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom and help us to, to understand really the, the overarching reason why you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live among this sin-cursed world. God, help us this morning as our prayer, and we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Well, this morning I want to I want to preach, and eventually we're going to wind back up. If maybe you just want to keep your Bible highlighted here, 
Uh, we're going to wind back up inside of verse number 32 eventually. And I want to preach on the thought of God's light switch, uh, who of course would be none other than the Lord Jesus Himself. Well, there was a man uh, back in uh, in the early earlier 1900s by the name of Hal Roach, and he was an American film and TV producer uh, in that era. And Mr. Hal Roach said uh, one particular year that some businessmen are saying that this is going to be the greatest Christmas ever. To which Mr. Hal Roach responded, I thought the first Christmas was. (laughs) Well, it is that first Christmas that has just taken place in the narrative that we read from just a moment ago here in Luke chapter number 2. We read in the earlier verses of this chapter how uh, that Jesus Christ was born according to every promise and prophecy that had ever been made. Jesus was born in fulfillment of every single one of those promises. And, and as you remember, at the birth of Jesus, and, and so many, you know, uh, providential acts are, are seen coming together at that point in time, uh, between the taxation and the extension of such a registration that was going on, and and, uh, and and Joseph being from the house and lineage of David and needing to travel back to Bethlehem so that, that it would be fulfilled uh, from Micah, that, that, that from Bethlehem, uh, a particular town inside of Judea, that, that the Messiah was going to be born. And so, uh, as it were, according to the providence of God, Mary and Joseph traveled back to Bethlehem in Judea. And at that particular time, uh, Mary is going to bring forth her firstborn son. Not her only son, uh, but at this point in time, her firstborn child into the world. And they name him Jesus, which, which would, would actually officially take place eight days later at his circumcision. And so there at, at the birth of Christ, you have these shepherds who are alerted by the angels as to what's taking place over inside of the city limits. And they come and they're worshiping the newborn king. And there was with them this host of angels singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill, good tidings to earth. And and, uh, and that's such a beautiful story. And it ought to be in our minds the most beautiful of all stories. Well, Well, the timeline here kind of works like this. You have the birth of Jesus Christ eight days later. Uh, Mary and Joseph are going to have Jesus circumcised on the eighth day according to the perfect letter of the law. And it is at this circumcision of Jesus that he would have officially received his, his name, which is a very interesting name, uh, just, just by way of, uh, of the Hebrew language. So, so Jesus' name in Hebrew was Yeshua. Uh, which really predominantly matches with the Hebrew word for, for salvation or even savior, if you will. And of course, we, we have already been told in the narrative that they were going to call his name Jesus back in Matthew 1 because he was going to save his people from their sins. And, and so the, the words Yeshua, the name of Christ, the name of Jesus in Hebrew is also the name salvation, Yeshua in, in Hebrew. There's only, there's only like one added letter for us transliterated. Uh, for the word salvation, there's the added letter H on the end, which is a silent. And so whether you're talking about Jesus or salvation, you're talking about one and the same. And so there's enough really for us to say amen and kind of run a lap on uh, this morning. And so you have the birth of Christ. Eight days later, he's he's circumcised. He's given his official name, uh, which is in connection with the ministry he will perform, becoming the Savior or being the Savior of the world. And then from there, 32 days later, On the 40th day of Jesus' life on earth, as it were, as a man, Mary and Joseph are going to bring Jesus, which is where our text for us that we read just a moment ago picks up at. Uh, Mary and Joseph are going to bring Jesus into the temple compound uh, with them. And there's really a dual purpose of this visit to the temple inside of Jerusalem on the 40th day of the the birth or the life of, of Jesus in the flesh. And the first reasoning, the first purpose was that uh, Mary was going to have to offer for her purification or for her cleansing, according to Leviticus chapter number 12, verses 1 through 8, if, uh, if a lady 
inside of Israel, if a, if a Jewish lady had a, a male child, if she gave birth to a son, then she was con, uh, considered to be ceremonially unclean for 40 days. And then at the culmination of those 40 days, she was to come to the temple and she was to offer for her cleansing or make a, a free will offering of sorts, if you will, for her to be ritually purified. And we, we find out exactly in this text inside of verse number 24, a verse earlier than we read from, uh, that she came and she offered a sacrifice according to that, which is said in the law of the Lord. Now notice what sacrifice she actually makes she gives a pair of turtle doves or of two young pigeons. She offers for her cleansing two birds, which is the first indication we have in our Bible concerning the poverty level of the family of Jesus, of Mary and Joseph. Because according to the law, they could have brought uh, a bull, they could have brought a, another kind or another animal to sacrifice, but if they could not afford uh, the uh, the the more expensive version of the sacrifice, there was an allowance for those in a lower class of economics to be able to bring two birds, either two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And we find that's what they bring. And so Jesus is part of a family that is not well off as far as financially speaking uh, uh, here. Uh, and we discover that here first in Luke chapter number 2. Well, well, you have to consider in, in lieu of all of this, in connection with all of this, that Mary and Joseph have had to leave their hometown and they've already had to travel to Bethlehem, which would have been kind of financially exhausting in the first place. And, uh, you know, whatever lodging there they secured and whatever expenses were uh, uh, were paid along the way. And now they are traveling back down into, uh, into Jerusalem for this. And, and I think one of the neat things here about the story and really just about the faith of Joseph and Mary is they have not allowed... Uh, the, the, the government requirements of a taxation of registering and paying money and all of those kinds of things associated with all of that. They have not allowed that to rob them of, of being faithful to their religious obligations. And so, and so they, seemingly in the text, they come into the temple very, very joyfully. They are, they are happy to come in and to offer for Mary's cleansing again, which is where our story is going to pick up. And so they, they come in to the temple, Mary and Joseph, along with Jesus. They enter into the temple, most likely through the east gate of the court, which was called the Nicanor Gate. And so they come in, and as they come in, they are going to meet with this very interesting character in our Bible, a man by the name of Simeon. And the Bible tells us about Simeon. Uh, the Bible gives us several uh, kind of points and pieces about Simeon, the Bible tells us in verse number 25 that he was a just man, he was a devout man, he was a man who was waiting for the consolation of Israel, a man in whom the Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse number 26, he was also a man who had been assured by God himself that he would not die until his eyes had laid hold on the Lord's Christ, on Messiah himself. And so the fact that Simeon was just means that he had righteous character. He was a man who lived according to the letter of the law. He wanted to please God. He wanted to show God that I love you by my obedience to you. He was a devout man, meaning he was devoted to the Lord. He was devoted to the law of Moses. He was a man who was just devoted to living right in his life. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, we use the word consolation as a prize, and that's very fitting here inside this story. Uh, Simeon was a man who was waiting for the ultimate prize of Israel, the thing that was the most, uh, the, 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 the most prized possession that Israel could ever receive, and that was going to be the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. And so Simeon is a man who is living in expectation that God is going to send the Messiah in order to redeem Israel from her sins. And so he's living in expectation. In other words, he's not living uh, like they were before the flood, unaware of God's movements. Simeon was not a man who was living like a like those who would be living just preceding the rapture, kind of unaware of what God's doing. No, no, Simeon was a man who was living in belief and in expectation that God is going to fulfill his promise. He is going to send Messiah, and I am longing for that day when he arrives. The Bible also tells us again 
that the Holy Ghost was upon him, which reminds us of the Old Testament administration of the Holy Spirit. A lot, a lot of folks had this idea that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, doesn't show up until Acts chapter number 2. But did you know that all the way back in your Bible in Genesis chapter number 1, we find that the Spirit of God is already moving in the act of creating the world and everything that is a part of this world. And so the Holy Spirit has been active uh, just as God the Father and God the Son have always been active not only in creation, but in the outworking of salvation's plan. And so we, we see here that the Holy Spirit is active even in the life of Simeon being really in a class of Old Testament saints. And then I am interested again, verse number 26, that it has been revealed to Simeon that, uh, and again revealed by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And, and I think there's a sequential progression here that, that Simeon was expecting, living in expectancy of seeing Christ before he was ever promised he was going to see the Lord's Christ. He was already living in such anticipation. And, and church, what that, what that looks like is that knowing that Christ is going to arrive at any point in time kind of purifies the way that I live my life. In fact, John the Apostle would say in 1 John that he that has this hope, speaking of a, of a church age, a church age, uh, age believers who are living knowing that Jesus Christ can return at any point in time and that those of us that have that hope, th that is, those of us that have this confidence and this expectation that we alter the way that we live our life, that we purify ourselves even as He is pure. Listen, you want to know whether or not you're really living in expectancy of Christ's return? We could just examine your life. And maybe we can examine what you're doing as far as the behaviors of your life. And that would tell us whether you really believe that Jesus Christ is coming back at any point in time. And so Simeon was already living that sort of a lifestyle. But then at one particular time, the Holy Ghost of God, uh, the third member of the Blessed Trinity, has communicated to Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Christ. By the way, I love the verbiage, verse number 27 the Bible says, and he, that is Simeon, came by the Spirit. You ought to underline that in your Bible. He came by the Spirit into the temple. Now, what, what does that look like? You know, like, like Simeon comes by, like, like, did the, did the Holy Spirit put, put Simeon in a half Nelson? You know, did he, did he like wrap his arms around him and kind of like thrust him in to the temple? You know, did he, did he hog tie him? Did he, did he put a, a rope around his neck and, and kind of just jerk him down the street? You know, what was it? A forceful movement? I, I don't believe that at all. I, I believe, I believe that Simeon just thought, you know what? Uh, today would be a beautiful day to go to the, or maybe there was an obligation, maybe there was a duty, maybe whatever the case is, or maybe, maybe Simeon just said, you know, I just, I have this incredible desire. I just want to go to the Lord's house. I just want to go to the temple. And, and as it just so happens, church, Simeon happens to come into the temple and happens to cross the path of Mary and Joseph at just the right time. And you could write in the margin of your Bible, what a sovereign and providential God who has by His Spirit directed Simeon's path to be in the right place at just the right time. And so we have this awesome character in Simeon. I love what Herbert Lockyer said about Simeon. He called him the man who died satisfied. <laughs> And there's probably not a lot of those living in the 21st century uh, who are going to die satisfied. But Simeon was the man who eventually, and, and he says it, now let your servant depart in peace because you have fulfilled your word to me. And that's what Simeon lived for. He didn't live for stocks and bonds and 401ks and, and, and all these, you know, popularity and prestige. He just lived to see the word of God come to pass. And that was enough for him. And so he's the man who died satisfied. And I might add to that, that Simeon lived in a very dark time uh, when you consider the religious environment of his day. And yet he didn't let, he didn't let all of the, all, all of the dark spots of religiosity in his day get him down. He kept his head up. He kept his faith in God and just lived for the Lord. And you know what? God was true to every promise that he had ever made, uh, specifically to Simeon, just as the Lord is faithful to keep all of His promises in our lives. Well, as their, as their paths cross, and, and Simeon recognizes, and, and, and at this point in time, they have made this, um, they, they have made this, uh, sacrifice for Mary's purification. 
The Bible tells us in verse number 27 that he, that he takes the child up. He came by the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do with him after the custom of the law. Verse 28, then took he him up in his arms and he begins to bless God. And so, and so he is now entering into this phase where, where he is sort of like a prophet. Well, he's not sort of. He has entered into a prophetical office. He begins not only to bless God, but he is identifying this child Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Here is the servant of the Lord from the book of Isaiah. Here is the one who has been promised from Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, all throughout the course of Old Testament revelation. This, this is him all wrapped up in the child, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And so Simeon begins making some prophetical statements, uh, one of which that I, I want to draw our attention to and really spend our time with is that statement that he makes in verse number 32. He's speaking of the fact that, that, that Christ is going to be a light. He is, he is going to prepare uh, the face of all the people. In, in other words, His ministry is going to go outside of the nation of Israel. And it's going to include others who are not uh, ethnically considered to be Jewish people. Verse number 32, he says that Jesus is a light to lighten the Gentiles. And so the word light here is an interesting word. The, the word light here means to shine or to make manifest. It's actually used of a lamp or a torch. Jesus is a lamp or a torch. He is, he is a light. He is a bright spot. He is what is shining or He is what is making manifest. The word is actually translated in both Mark chapter 14 and Luke 22 as the fire that Peter stood beside as he warmed his hands, you know, kind of in the enemy's camp, uh, that, uh, uh, the night of Jesus' arrest. And, and, and so here is, Here's this word that is just indicative of exposure. Jesus is, is an exposure. He is a disclosure. He is, he is an illumination. He is, he is shining out. And so Jesus is a light to lighten. And the word lighten here is, is word, uh, apocalypsis. Uh, this is the word for revelation, the last, the last book inside of our New Testament. And it is interesting, uh, here that, that this word lighten, a noun in the accusative sense, further identifies what kind of light that Jesus really was. In other words, Jesus isn't a blinding light. You ever seen one of those? You ever been in like that 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 deep sleep? You know, uh, scientists tell us there's different levels of sleep and, you know, you get in that deep level of sleep. I don't know how many of you get there. I don't feel like I ever get there, you know. And Amber's just always snoring and making all kinds of movements and y'all believe that, right? Amen. And so, um, you know, you get in that that deep level of sleep or maybe you're there and then, and then your kind, loving, precious, you know, maybe, maybe parent or sibling comes in the room and flips on the light switch and you try to open your eyes and you can't see anything because the light is blinding you or, or someone's grace is nothing, you know, take like a, like a, a, a 5,000 lumen flashlight and stick it right there close to your eyeball and, and open up or, or, or the, the thing that I, I, I really enjoy is to make a trip to the dentist and to sit in that chair where they put the spotlight right in your face and you walk out and your face is glowing like you've been in the presence of God, but you haven't been. You've just been at the dentist and you get like this, uh, like the suntan immediately. And what makes that even better is that the, the hygienist is trying to carry on a conversation with you while you got all of these utensils that are sharp and freaking, and I'm already bleeding to death. I can see the blood on the little napkin that they put there, you know. And, uh, and, and so there, Jesus isn't that kind of light. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank God. Amen. He, he's not a blinding light. What kind of light is he? Well, he is a disclosing light. He is, he is a revealing light. Jesus does not, uh, 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 what, what Simeon is saying here is that, is that Jesus doesn't bring a revelation. He is the revelation of God. He, he, he is not just showing an image or an imagery creating an imagery of God. No, no, He is the image of God. He does not have revelation. Jesus is the revelation. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1, we read this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apocalypsis, the, the manifestation of Jesus Christ. He is the, the light that lightens literally the entire world. And so Simeon is saying, here is what Jesus Christ reveals. Now, now next... Simon is going to identify who Jesus 
lightens or, or who it is that Jesus brings this sword of revelation to. Now, now we're all familiar with uh, Jesus' statement in John chapter 8, verse number 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of who? I'm the light of the world. And, and again, there's the universality of the ministry of Christ, that, that He is the revelation of God for every single person in the world. But here inside of our text, in verse number 32, Simeon narrows it down to a specific group of people. And this is like the wow factor of, of Luke's gospel narrative so far. Okay? It's not just that Jesus was born. We know, we, we know that. And, and, and we have the prophecies and the promises that that was going to happen. But here is the wonder of wonder that really never loses its wow effect all the way through New Testament revelation. And that is this grand fact that Jesus Christ is a light to lighten the Gentiles. It was the expectancy of Judaism of this day that Jesus Christ was going to come for the Jews. He was going to come as a Jew. He was going to come to the Jews. He was going to come for the Jews. And we know salvation is of who? Well, it's of the Jews. And, and He came unto His own. And even the gospel message, according to Paul in Romans 1.16, is to be preached to the Jew first before it's ever preached to a Greek or to a Gentile world. So, so Simeon narrows down the revelation of Christ and says he is here to lighten the Gentiles. And the word Gentiles is ethnos in the Greek. It's where we get our English words ethnic or ethnicity from. And really this word just refers to all of society excluding Jewish people. And so it doesn't matter what other kind of uh, race or, or color or whatever there is that goes into making up uh, humanity, if you are not a Jew, then you are considered to be broadly a Gentile, another ethnic group. And, and so what Simeon is saying here is really incredible when you consider that God up until this point uh, has primarily dealt with one nation all the way back from Genesis chapter number 12. God called one man by the name of Abram uh, and establishes with him his covenant. We call it the Abrahamic covenant. There's a stretch, right? And so God establishes this perpetual covenant with, with the descendants of Abraham and, and the line will be carried down through Isaac and Jacob. And from Jacob are going to stand the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel. And God is pri- not exclusively, but primarily going to deal with this one nation. And that takes you from Genesis 12 through Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua and Judges and Ruth and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. And if I keep going, I'm going to get myself in trouble not being able to go through the books of the Bible in front of everybody. But all the way through until you get into the New Testament revelation. And here we are alerted to the fact that God's not just primarily dealing with the Jews anymore, but He has sent His Son particularly to be a light to lighten the Gentiles. And so this is incredible. In, in fact, uh, Isaiah chapter 49, I believe it is, makes this statement. God says, I will also, speaking of His servant, by the way, uh, a, a, a character in the book of Isaiah called the servant of Jehovah, the servant of the Lord. God says, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And so some 700 years before this encounter of Simeon with Jesus and Mary and Joseph, God had already promised that that His servant, the Messiah, the Lord's Christ, was going to be a light to lighten the Gentiles and be His salvation unto the ends of the world. Now here's... Here's the question that, we, that we've come to answer this morning. Exactly what kind of revelation does Jesus give? When, when Simeon makes this declaration that, that he is a light to lighten the Gentiles, exactly what revelation is Jesus bringing to Gentile people? Okay, And I, I want to answer that question uh, with three answers, Okay, because I'm a pastor and I give no short answers. In fact, every answer I give has to have a minimum of three points along with subpoints. okay? And so we're going to jump into answering that question. Here's, here's the first answer that I would give to what kind of revelation does Jesus give. Number one, Jesus reveals the true God, okay? Uh, in, in opposition to all the fake or false gods, Jesus reveals who is 
the true God. You know, is it, is it like uh, universalism today that all roads lead to heaven? Are all religions the same? Are all gods the same? And you can't say one God is better than another God. Well, no, Jesus reveals that there is only one true living God. And anything outside of Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, the God that the Bible declares from beginning to end, anything outside of Him is a false God. It is a pagan God. It is to, if someone has pledged their allegiance to such a, uh, such a, a idol, then they are considered to be a idol worshiper and idolater. So, so, so when we talk about Jesus revealing who the true God really is, we're not talking about Jesus revealing God to church going folks. And we're, we're not talking here about Jesus revealing God to the nation of Israel even with, with all of the advantages they had to being a Jew. No, when we're dealing with Simeon's declaration here, we're talking about Jesus Christ revealing who the true God is to a people group that by and large have never had a relationship with this God. He's revealing God to a people group that have worshipped every other God under heaven other than the one true and living God. In fact, did you know that in the earlier days of the church that Christians were considered to be atheists? because they denied all of the pagan gods of the Roman Empire to the exclusion of only one true God. And so they were considered to be atheists. This is the world, and particularly to the people group, that Jesus came into the world in Revelation up. Jesus is revealing God to a people that by and large have never known who this one true and living God really is. Well, there's a lot of ways that we can talk about this revelation. I think one of the greatest ways to see this, though, is, is for us to remember uh, Jesus' interaction with Gentile people. You know, as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's real easy to walk away from reading those gospel narratives and think, well, Jesus only ministered to Jewish people. Did you know that's not true? Did you know that Jesus actually had a pretty predominant ministry to Gentile people. In fact, John would go as far as to tell us there was a particular time in the ministry of Christ where all the world was looking to see Jesus. And, and that included the Gentile, the Greek-speaking world outside of mainstream Judaism. Well, well, we have an episode that I want to remind us about that takes place. You don't have to necessarily turn there, but in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through verse number 28, you'll remember it well. Uh, Jesus is ministering, and there is a woman who is going to approach him. The Bible tells us in Matthew 15, verse number 21, that it is a woman that comes out of the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, if you're not familiar with Tyre and Sidon, this is modern-day Lebanon, which is just north of Israel. In fact, you have to go out of the boundaries of northern Israel in order to get to the cities of Tyre and Sidon. So a woman in Matthew 15 is approaching Jesus who is an outsider. Well, to borrow from Paul's terminology in Ephesians 2, here is a foreigner, an alien. Here is a stranger to the covenants of, and promises. And she, as a Gentile woman, crosses over into Judean territory with a sole purpose of coming to see Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 7 verse 26 tells us furthermore of the identity of this woman that she is a Greek woman. In fact, Mark would call her a Syrophoenician woman. And then, and then Matthew would go as far in pinpointing her, her nationality to, to her actual uh, ethnic background. Verse number 22 of Matthew 15, Matthew actually goes as far as to call her a Canaanite woman. Here are a group of people, the Canaanites, who are the most despised of all people in the Old Testament. Here, here is the people group who God is going to drive out of the land. It was the land of Canaan that God gave possession to, to His descendants, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and, and on down the line. They, they are the most despised people who have been driven out of the land here is a lady that has probably been raised with prejudice. Here is a lady who has been raised to hate Jewish people. 
she, she has and, and her family has been pushed out of the land of, of their own nativity, a land that originally had belonged to them. And so, so here is this woman who more than likely has this prejudice against Jews and she lives outside the land. She's Greek. She's a Syrophoenician. She is a Canaanite. And yet she leaves and she comes into the land of Israel all for the purpose of coming to Jesus. So why does she come? Why make the trip? Why risk the embarrassment? And by the way, Matthew 15 does look very embarrassing to us when we read it with Western eyes. Because as she beseeches the Lord on the behalf of her demon-possessed child, Jesus says to her, in essence, no. It's, I, I've only come, Jesus says, Matthew 15, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it is, and she persists. And Jesus says to her, woman, it is not meat to take the food from the table and feed it to dogs. To which the woman responds, truth, Lord, you're right. But even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. And Jesus says, you know what, lady? I have not found so great a faith in all of Israel. And, and so he does exactly what the woman had come to, to get him to do, to request for him to do. Now, let's, let's go back to my main question. Why does this lady come to Jesus Christ? How does she know? She's asked, she doesn't have a Bible. She doesn't have a temple. She is not known for her worship of the one true and living God. Can, may, may, may I tell you why she becomes convinced that, 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 that the true God is the true God? Because of the person of Jesus Christ. It has been noised abroad, not just in Jerusalem, not just in Galilee, not, not just in some other regions, not, not even just in Samaria from John chapter 4, but it has been noised abroad outside of the land going into Lebanon and going over into Perea and going, going south. And, and it is extending out everywhere. Everyone is hearing about how amazing this person is who is called Jesus the Christ. And, and the whole world has become enthralled with him. So much so again that John says the whole world has gone after him. That was the religious leader's declaration. They said, do, do you not see? It's not just us. It's everyone that's coming. Jesus, Jesus's light was, was so permeating that it reached to the people who were in the darkest regions of religion, Jesus reveals who the true God is. If, if you want to see the Father, Jesus says you could just look at Him. If you've seen me, Jesus says you've seen the Father. So He reveals the true God. Number two this morning, Jesus reveals the essence of sin. Jesus reveals the essence of sin. So, and I, I thought about it this past week, you know, I, I remember growing up and, and, and even still today, you know, uh, you, you can clean a house, and when I say you, I mean you, because I, most of the time, I don't. <laughs> uh, but, but you could clean. My mother could clean our house, and my wife can clean our house, and, and, uh, and, and it can even be on like one of those great days, ladies, like when the kids are gone, and you know, they, they're, they're like spending the night with somebody, or they're off on some activity. And so you really think, hey, I'm going to be able to clean the house today, and it's going to stay cleaner you know, longer than 15 minutes or 15 seconds or whatever kind of kids that, that you have, okay? And so it's a great day, right? And so you work hard and you clean, you, you, you sweep, you mop, you dust, you clean the windows, you do all those kinds of things. And maybe sometime around 12, some of y'all look like you need an altar call maybe about cleaning the house. I don't know. Sometime maybe around 12, 1 o'clock, the sunlight starts coming in the window. And what do you see? where there's dust floating around in the air and there's dust on the floor if you've got laminate flooring and there's dust on the, on the, on the end table and the coffee table and everywhere else in your house. And so you, you're saying, what, what, what happened? Did, did the dust and dirt just magically appear from nowhere? No, no, it hasn't appeared. It was there the whole time. It's just that the light source has revealed that the dust and dirt we're there. It is an exposure of sorts. And so, 
When we say that Jesus reveals the true essence of sin, I'm not saying that Jesus came and brought sin with Him and sprinkled it around uh, with, with, with the people that He was ministering to. The essence of sin had always been here ever since Genesis chapter number 3. It was, it was there. But modern day Judaism and other religions had tried to just kind of cover it up, kind of mask it up, if you will. You know, kind of like if I see dust on the counter uh, or, or, or the end table in my house and, and you walk in and maybe I'm embarrassed of it, I may just kind of take my hand and swipe it like that. It makes that surface look good, but it makes the surface down there look a little bit worse. And so we're just kind of pushing it around and masking it up. And that's all religion has been able to accomplish for a very, very long time is it's just kind of covered it up and it's compounded uh, it's compounded, uh, it's, uh, it, it's quantity. And so Jesus Christ comes into this world, and one of the things, one of the ministries that He performs is the exposing, the revealing of the true essence of what sin really is. Now, now this is a very important work, especially for Gentiles who were notorious Sinners. In fact, there was, there was such a disconnect from Jews and Gentiles. Listen to Paul's words in Galatians 2.15. Paul says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. In other words, we're bad, but they're a lot worse than we are. Okay? Well, the worse you are, the more you need to be convinced of how bad off you really are. And so Jesus comes in as a light to lighten the Gentiles. He is going to reveal. He is going to expose. Now, now here's the thing. Uh, if Jesus is the Savior what, uh, of the world, and He is, what good is it to be a Savior or the Savior of the world if nobody sees their need to be saved? And so in order to be the Savior of the world, Jesus has to convince, He has to reveal just how sinful mankind really has become at this particular point in time. And so He comes in and He begins to reveal just that, that mankind is, are, they are all sinners. They have all done abominable things. There is none righteous, no, not one. And that is, by and large, His ministry is exposing just how bad sin really is. In fact, did you know that a lot of the sinful behaviors that the Israelites had throughout their history, they had actually seen and learned from Genesis Gentile communities. And so as Jesus is light to the Gentiles, He is really ministering to the worst of the worst kind of people. In fact, we talked about the Canaanite woman just a, a second ago. Did, did you know a, a religious, a, a Canaanite religious practice, and, and one of their gods was Moloch or Molech. You remember him? He was the god that they worshipped by burning their children alive. I mean, this is, this is like the worst of the worst kind of crowd. And Simeon says Jesus has come to bring light. He's come to bring revelation. He is the revelation uh, for these folks. He is, he is revealing not just who the true God is, but He's going to reveal how bad off these people are, the actual essence of sin. Now, here's what religion taught in Jesus' day. 2,000 years ago, across the ocean, here's what religion taught. Religion taught this. And it didn't matter, honestly, if you were Jewish or if you were a Gentile. Religion taught primarily this principle. You do the very best you can, and everything will be okay. Now that was articulated in some different ways, and they had different books, and they called their gods different gods, and all of that kind of stuff. But even mainstream Judaism had, had, had evolved or devolved into a belief system that as long as I tried my very best, everything was going to be okay with me at the end of the day. Well, that sounds a lot, not just like religion 2,000 years ago across an ocean, but that sounds a lot like religion today here on American soil. In fact, probably anywhere you go in the world, that is the idea of, of religion. Well, the masters of doing the best that a person could do were called Pharisees in Jesus' day. I mean, they, they, they did everything by the book. In fact, they added to the book and kept those rules as well. Well, what does that mean? That because they have become better people, that sin has been dealt with. Well, here was the message of Jesus. No. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 20, here's what Jesus is going to say. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise 
inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus tells the most religious people in the world at that point in time, your religion, your religious behavior isn't good enough. (laughs) Because sin, the essence of sin, goes deeper than the surface. Okay? Your your problem, can can I help you this morning? Okay, I want to try to be a blessing. Our problem this morning isn't, isn't your language. Okay? Our problem isn't, isn't our wardrobe. Our problem isn't our politics. Our problem is, is not just the lies that we may tell. Our problem is not the things that we may take that don't belong to us. Our problem is not just fornication, adultery, drunkenness. Our problem is not just in America. It's not just homosexuality and LGBTQ, RSV, YW, and the rest of that. That's not the problem. The problem goes a lot, cause, cause here's the reality. You can fix all of that. And we can make society, if you'll, if you'll forgive me this word, we can make society straight again. Okay? We, we could, we could go through prohibition and we could get rid of all the alcohol and we could reform language and we could reform civil behaviors and we could, we could start, you know, uh, 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 uh maybe just more civil punishments if you take things that don't belong to you. Let's stop chopping hands off and arms off. And, and we can reform society. But at the end of the day, if we have an upright, moral society and you don't have Jesus Christ, you're still going to die and go to hell. Because the essence of sin goes further than what we are doing on the outside. In fact, here's, here's how Jesus said it. It is from within, out of the heart of man. That all these things, murders, thefts, fornications, blasts, all, all, I do what I do on the outside because I am by nature corrupt on the inside. And so when Jesus says your righteousness has to exceed, he, he's saying your righteousness has to go deeper. It has to go further. It has to go beyond external behaviors. Okay? So a, a great question I think to ask ourselves is what does your righteousness look like this morning? You know, so many folks in America, so many folks that are sitting on a pew in some Christian church or maybe even some Baptist church this morning are thinking to themselves this thought, I'm good because I go to church. Or I'm fine because I'm a member of a church. Or I I put some money in an offering plate or a box this morning. I've been baptized. Or, or man, I'm, I'm a really good, I mean, I, I mean, man, like, I, I, I gave money to help some people out for Christmas. This, I'm a good person. And Jesus would say to us today, except your righteousness goes beyond the righteousness of good church attending folk, you will in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Let me give you the last thing this morning. Jesus is coming. He has, he has light to lighten in the sense that He reveals the means of salvation. The only way that a person can be saved. So, so here is what we would call really, uh, again, the wonder of wonders for really the entire, uh, uh, time period of the, of the early church. Okay. There, there was a contention that lasted throughout really the first few decades of church history. And, and we actually see it coming uh, out inside of our Bibles. And, and it's the, this kind of contention. The question is, in the New Testament times, beginning with, with the earlier chapters of the book of Acts, is this. How can a Gentile be saved? What must a Gentile person, someone who is not a Jew, what must they do in order to be saved? So one of the teachings that was gaining popularity in the early church was that in order for a Gentile to be saved, a Gentile would have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And so it's kind of like a two-step process kind of thing, you know. You had to become a Jewish person, meaning you had to, you had to make sure that you had been circumcised if you're a male and uh, you had to go through a, a, uh, a baptism of sorts where you became a proselyte Jew and you had to commit yourself to keeping the Sabbath day holy and other religious days and ceremonies and you had to commit to all of those things. And when you committed to the letter of the Mosaic law, now you could place your faith in Jesus Christ. And so it's a conglomeration of works plus grace kind of co-mingled together. And so this is a really hot topic and it comes to light in books of the Bible like the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, even the book of Colossians. It's, it's really scattered all throughout some of the New Testament epistles where folks think that a Gentile gets saved first by becoming a Jew 
and then by becoming a Christian. In fact, this very topic was the focal point of the first council meeting that ever took place in church history that we find and read about in Acts chapter number 15. And in Acts chapter 15, uh, the church meets together to decide how is it that a Gentile person actually comes to be saved from their sins. And there's, a, there's another Simeon who comes into play in Acts chapter number 15. We, we know him better by his other name, Simon or Peter or even Cephas. And, and here's, here was Peter's declaration in Acts chapter 15, verse number 14. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for His name. Peter has, has declared and sent word to this Jerusalem council meeting that God Himself has visited the Gentiles to call out of them a people for His own. In other words, God has selected, He has called certain ones of the Gentiles to be saved for His own glory. Again, but how are those individuals going to come to be saved at last? Well, the decision, the correct decision that, that they come to in Acts chapter number 15 is that a Gentile person is saved in the same exact way that a Jewish person was saved. And a Jewish person was going to be saved by grace through faith in Christ. And so a, a Gentile believer, okay, someone who has never been to church, someone who has never worshipped the one true living God, someone who is a notorious sinner, who has a background like you wouldn't believe. And, and maybe they've been to prison, and, and maybe they've done drugs, and maybe they're drunkards, and maybe they've been prostitutes, and maybe they have participated in religious activities that we know nothing of, and they are just kind of like like the, the, the lower class of society that, 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 that we may you know kind of want to be alerted to if they live in our neighborhood because we may want to lock our doors and be a little bit more careful. So, so how is it that that kind of a person comes to have a complete, perfect, right standing with God? Where the decision is that they come to know God by grace, through faith, in Christ, plus or minus absolutely nothing. Do you know... Do you know who actually revealed that? It wasn't the Jerusalem council meeting. It wasn't Peter, and it wasn't Paul, and it wasn't Barnabas, and it wasn't later with Silas. It wasn't any of those folks. The person who revealed that was Jesus Christ Himself. In fact, in John chapter 12, Jesus is going to make this, this really incredible statement. He's going to say, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Now, and let me help those of us with a, with a charismatic or contemporary background. That doesn't mean that as we praise and worship Him, more folks are going to be saved. This isn't jam to the lamb kind of stuff. Okay, all right. Um, verse 33 says, This spake He, signifying what manner of death He should die. Jesus Himself reveals that the only way that the world is going to be saved is if He dies in their place on a cross. Jesus is preaching the substitutionary atonement that we're saved because He took our place. He suffered our hell for us. He, he paid the price that I was, number one, unwilling to pay, and number two, unfit to pay. And Jesus paid it all. Jesus dies in our place. Uh, I think it was Peter that said it like this. He that was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. And, and there is a divine exchange where Jesus took my place so that I could take his. He became what I was so that I become, I could become what he is. And so I stand accepted in the beloved with a perfect standing before God. And now my past no longer matters. And where I've been and what I've done and, and what memories I have and, and all of that are, are no longer binding to me because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And that doesn't mean freedom like I can just live how I please. No, no there's a freedom from all of my past. 
And from everything I've ever been associated, it has all been swallowed up in Christ. And so Paul would say in Romans chapter number 8, who then or what then could ever separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Could tribulation, could peril, could nakedness, could sword, I mean, could Hamas, could, could, could some terrorist organization, could worldwide famine, could drought, could, could the LGBTQ community, could, could uh, uh, Democrats being in power, could Donald Trump going to prison, could, uh, could any of these things ever mess up my right standing with God? And Paul says, nay. <laughs> but in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Gentiles are saved the same way Jews were, without the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I feel like before we close, I do have to point out that doesn't mean that we are without law unto Christ. There are regulations to live by as Christians. There are just no regulations to be saved by as Christians. And so here we stand today. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to be a light to lighten the Gentiles. We are here today on, on a Sunday morning as 2023 is drawing down to a conclusion all because Jesus Christ came to reveal the true God and to reveal the nature, the essence of sin and to reveal to us the only means of salvation. And so today... If you're here and maybe you've been religious and maybe you've got some kind of idea what the Bible's talking about. Maybe you were raised in church and maybe you're a member of a church. Maybe you're a member of this church. Maybe, maybe you've been baptized and maybe you wrote a check this morning or whatever the case is. But, but, but if, but if you were to be pressed, maybe you think the reason why I'm going to die and go to heaven is because I've done something that I'm here to tell you you're not on your way to heaven. What you need to do is see the light that Jesus brought to reveal the only way that a person is and can be saved is by turning from your sin and embracing the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that He has done it all. And you have to lay yourself down in absolute faith and trust Him alone as your Lord and Savior. And for those of us that have done that, we're saved. And some of you have been saved for maybe months, some years, some decades. But ever how long we've been saved, you and I have this amazing task. Listen, Jesus is the light and was the light. But He has also entrusted you and I to be the light of the world. To reveal these very things to a world that still sits in darkness to, to this extreme. That Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let me ask you a question as we close this morning. How bright is your light shining? The people that you go to school with, that you work around, that the people that you live next door to, are they convinced who God really is because your light shining? Are they convinced how bad and awful sin really is because of the way that you live your life? It, it, are, are the people that you live around, are they convinced that there's only one way to be saved because of the way you're letting your light shine before men, that they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. May God help us this morning. Let's stand for prayer.